Hi everyone, so uh, today we're actually going to finish up lecture six uh, for this part, just for the lecture section. Obviously we'll do some more problems to uh, get you a little bit more practice, but uh, anyways, we're, we talked last time about homogeneous nucleation, and the big kind of takeaway from that lecture was a couple of things, actually. So we found that this delta GR had these two terms, which one was negative, so one was four-thirds pi r cubed delta GV, plus this interfacial term, four pi r squared uh, times your gamma SL. And remember, we said that this was your interfacial inter excuse me, so that basically this was your area term. So the energy penalty you pay when you create area, that increases gives energy, not good. This was your volumetric term. That drives uh, essentially nucleation. We figured out uh, this kind of R star value. So when you set the G R, set the derivative set equal to zero, you could find the critical radius that grows or shrinks. So if R is less than R star, we shrink. If R is greater than R star, we will grow. So that was kind of the general rules. And then we found uh, this really kind of nice curve uh, for the steady state nucleation grate, which was this competition between, uh, again, that delta GR diffusion, so our steady state nucleation rate versus as a function of undercooling. We saw kind of this shape. We're on this side of the curve here. We are at delta T is large. Increase, increase. So our temperature is really, really low. So here, delta GR dominates. Nucleation. Nucleation dominates on this side. On this side, our delta T is very, very low. Our temperature is really, really high. So here, we have diffusion dominates. So D dominates. And we saw that there's this kind of critical amount of undercooling that we need to even start nucleating particles. So those were the highlights of homogeneous nucleation in a nutshell. Obviously, please watch the video and please read uh, my previous video. And please read uh, essentially the OER and the lecture notes uh, to kind of get a more thorough understanding and practice some of the problems with the problem set. Now we're going to talk about heterogeneous nucleation. So the schematic that we kind of drew for homogeneous, homogeneous nucleation was basically this particle kind of nucleates out of nowhere. Um, but... That's really, and, it, and we have to kind of pay this full uh, surface area kind of energy penalty. But that's not really what happens, right, in real life. So I know a lot of you in class love that show Forged in Fire. Um, I haven't watched, uh, especially with this remote teaching plan, <laughs> I haven't watched as much as I want to. But typically, when you're kind of pouring metal into like a cast, so we're pouring in liquid metal here, right? And actually, if you're interested in, uh, if you're interested in actually solidification and kind of metalworking and forging, and all this stuff. I have lots of kind of this, uh, some really cool notes from when I was an undergrad uh, taking materials processing. We could talk more about that offline or online again now because everything is that. But anyways, um, when you pour it into this mold, so this is our mold. Oftentimes it's cooled, so water cooled. It could be copper. Water cooled, not cold. Cooled. Where do, where are the particles going to start to solidify? At the center here? No, they're going to solidify. You're going to start solidifying basically this little skin of, of solid right at the walls. Why is that? Well, one reason is that you intuitively uh, you know, understand is that it's much colder against the wall. But we're going to see that there's an additional reason why we want to nucleate on surfaces uh, as well. And that's kind of the key aspect to heterogeneous nucleation. Uh, and again, this is the more common scenario. Heterogeneous nucleation is much more common than homogeneous nucleation. So let's look at the differences. So let's think about that example of cooling kind of on that wall, on that surface. So uh, the real reason heterogeneous nucleation is, uh, and actually it's more common, it's easier, it's because this activation energy for nucleation is lowered uh, when you form on pre-existing surfaces. We're going to talk about that in a second. So that's heterogeneous nucleation. So let's look, uh, and on the next page, let's look at a kind of an example of solidifying on kind of this surface. So this is kind of the zoomed in version of basically solidifying on that substrate. So here, my C, uh, the cluster is this kind of C term here. The surface or the substrate is the S terms. And then the L is your liquid. So that's just some uh, kind of notation uh, just to kind of get us by here uh, while we kind of continue. So the important thing to kind of note here 
Why is heterogeneous nucleation, why does it lower the activation energy? Why is it easier for this type of nucleation versus homogeneous where you're just nucleation, you're nucleating kind of in a vacuum? How much surface area are we creating here versus what we're creating here? How much liquid solid in it? So like here's my liquid, here's my solid, here's my kind of solid cluster, and here's my liquid, which has larger surface area? This is a sphere, this has four pi r squared. This surface area that we're creating, again, that's always when we create area, we're creating an energy penalty. This opposes nucleation. So if I have to create more surface area, it's going to be harder to nucleate. Here, I'm not creating nearly as much surface area, right? Like just from looking at it, it's like almost basically you almost cut your, you know, the amount of surface area in half. So that's why heterogeneous, heterogeneous nucleation is more common. It's easier. It's easier to nucleate than easier than homogeneous. So homogeneous. Because, again, we're creating less area. So less area created. So that's kind of the key aspect here. So that's why heterogeneous nucleation is easier because it always comes down when we're nucleating. This is competition between volume, which is negative, plus your area. If we make this contribution even smaller, now we're cooking with gasoline. We could, this increases, we're making this smaller, now we're good to go. Then we will nucleate and we could uh, basically move on to nucleating easier with less undercooled. So let's now, that was our physical intuition. You obviously know what's coming next. Uh, that's the most important thing. I want you to kind of keep that in mind. But now we can do some math to kind of prove this and rewrite some expressions. So, I hope, I know you all are statics experts. You've taken statics hopefully while or you know, before you've taken this class. So, if I want to do, uh, basically, again, you could think of surface tension. If I want to do a force balance here, I could just do, again, gamma SL is equal to gamma SC plus, again, I want to do the uh, projection of this vector in this direction. So, if I want to balance all these surface tensions in, you know, this is my coordinate system, one and two. If I want to balance in one, here's my balance right there. So we are going to use that expression because we are going to have to rewrite our kind of free energy terms. So in addition, so here again, we have for heterogeneous nucleation. So remember, we had our previous expression, and you can look back in the homogeneous nucleation video. We've kind of figured out this delta G from G2 minus G1. So we had this expression. This is just our volume term. That remains the same. That will be there regardless. But now we have uh, basically this additional, or actually the set of additional terms right here. So here we are going to have the area associated with the liquid and the cluster, the substrate and the cluster, and the substrate and the liquid. So we have to kind of account for all these different areas in the heterogeneous nucleation case. So the term gets a little much more complicated than our kind of our nice other term, which was just uh, the area of your solid liquid interface times your gamma cell. So much easier in the homogeneous case. Now we have these three different uh, kind of areas and you are all, again, statics experts I'm sh and trig experts. I'm sure you could kind of derive uh, this expression here for the volume of the cap and the area of the cap and the area of the liquid cluster interface. And so, no, you don't need to know this. Uh, again, this is not an important term. This is kind of just map and again, trig notation. There's one quick, uh, uh, kind of notation error here, just to be consistent, this should be liquid cluster interface, just in our notation. It's, it means the same thing with the liquid and your spherical particle. So excuse me, this should be LC. But anyways, just be consistent uh, from previously. You don't need to know how to kind of derive this. The key thing is that we are going to kind of rewrite, this is again for heterogeneous. Look at this equation. Our homogeneous equation, delta GR, was just this minus four-thirds IR cubed delta GV plus four pi R squared gamma SL. And remember, SL in this is equal to LC in this notation. Anyways, look at these equations. For homogeneous, this is hetero, this is for homo, homogeneous nucleation. They're essentially the same with the exception of this term right here. This takes into account the geometry of that cap. That's the only difference in this expression. We tack on this multiplicative factor. 
of this S theta. So how is that going to influence essentially our curve and how we nucleate? So my question to you, will the R star be the same, the critical radius that grows or shrinks, will it be the same for homo and hetero? How do we solve for the critical radius? Well, what we did was we took the derivative of g with respect to r, set it equal to zero. If I take the derivative of this with respect to r and set it equal to zero, and this with respect to r and set it equal to zero, am I going to get the same value? Yeah, because this is just a multiplicative factor. So we take the derivative, we set it equal to zero, this moves over and gets canceled out immediately. So the critical, the critical radius uh, remains unchanged. So r star is the same, r star, same for homo and hetero. Sorry. Homo and hetero. Now, what really changes here is once you plug it back in to the delta G equation. So you'll notice, once you plug in back r, uh, r star into your expression, Again, this looks the same as our uh, previous expression, but with one critical difference. Look at this factor here. The S theta factor is going to be less than 1 for all values less than 180 degrees. So if your theta, that angle that we saw on the cap previously, if that is less than 180 degrees, which is, oh, you know, typically will always be, we are going to lower that energy barrier. Again, just like we uh, talked about previously. And it's kind of the same idea, right? As we, if you decrease the amount of area that you have to create, you're decreasing kind of the activation energy, the barrier to nucleate the particles. We can see that a little bit or much more clearly up here. Sorry about that. Yes. This is essentially the curves for heterogeneous and homogeneous nucleation. And you can see here the R star value, R star is the same for both of these. The only thing that changes is the energy barrier, the energy here, the energy here. It's much harder to nucleate particles for homogeneous nucleation versus hetero. Now, you may be asking yourself, again, we spent a lot of time, let me go back. We talked about this curve a lot last lecture. You could see some of the notes previously. And I said that this is such an important parameter, this delta T critical, when we can nucleate particles, how that will change as we go from homogeneous to heterogeneous nucleation. So let's look at the curves here. What do you notice about the steady state nucleation curves of heterogeneous versus homogeneous? Look at the amount. This is our delta T crit. So delta T critical versus homogeneous nucleation. The, look at the delta T crit for heterogeneous. Super small, right? Why is that? Because, again, delta T is your driving force to nucleate. That is the amount of undercooling, the amount of low temperature required to basically shift from liquid to solid. If that value, again, if we're having to create less and less area, we're going to need less driving force in order to nucleate those particles. So you see the shift here. The curve shifts for heterogeneous nucleation to lower and lower T crits. We can nucleate. This is saying that we can nucleate at higher temperatures. So this is a critical kind of finding. Again, because, all just because we have to create less surface area. That's the only difference really between heterogeneous and homogeneous nucleation. We, don't, we already have the surface that we could kind of cling on to, and we just have to create smaller surface here compared to the entire surface area for homogeneous nucleation. That's the only difference uh, between these scenarios. Now, one of the tricky exam questions that I could typically, that I have asked in the past, and I might ask, in a problem set or again in an exam this semester. Always remember kind of the duality of these curves. So if I give you a plot like this versus temperature, and I gave you two curves like this and another curve like this, which of these is homogeneous nucleation and which of these is heterogeneous nucleation? That is a kind of a key question I want to kind of leave you with. So if I switch these axes, uh, let me get a little bit, actually, let me redraw these real quick. Excuse me. 
So if I redraw this app, I as a function of this is TM, this is temperature now. So if I have a curve like this, if I have another curve that's like this, which is heterogeneous, which is homogeneous. Please let me know uh, and uh, kind of think about that. And if you have any questions, if you can't answer uh, this question, again, it's just flipped, right? So what's the critical undercooling? It's when we start to nucleate, which is here and here. So this is smaller than this and this. So this is het, this is homo. Just flipped. So hopefully that uh, makes sense. Again, T idea, if we have to create less area, we have to, we could basically nucleate easier. We lower that activation energy. We don't need as much driving force. That driving force is the lower temperatures, the delta T, and we're good to go. So please let me know if you have any questions uh, kind of on lecture six. We're moving now on to a section where I think that you all, uh, especially the mechanics people, the civil engineers, uh, you'll kind of do very well, which is the mechanics lecture. So stress and strain, a critical lecture, a huge lecture. So get ready for that. I think you'll really enjoy that. Uh, and yeah, finish up your problem set. And as always, if you have any questions, please let me know and uh, be safe and yeah, have a great day.